Hello and welcome to episode 68 of the Boot Nerds podcast. I almost forgot what number it was, even though we just talked about it five seconds ago. J. Mike, what's going on? I'm not too bad, my friend. Uh, again, football is coming back thick and fast now. So, uh, so you know what? Life is uh, is pretty good op- over here. Uh, Denmark is opening up. It's uh, it's not it's not too bad. How are you doing? We're I'm doing okay. We're still pretty much shut down until I believe June second. Wow. So at that point, they're going to make another call. But things are starting to open up. It's not completely as locked down as it has been over the last two months or so. So things are starting to get back to normal. But I mean, we're still we're still a little ways away. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good thing. You have something to look forward to, you know, to football opening up and stuff. But the good thing is that actually you can still watch some football if you go and watch the Bundesliga. I realize you have to wake up really early, but, uh, but, but did you do it? We, I did. I did. You I did. was very excited to watch on the Saturday. Yeah. It was uh, 9am. wasn't too bad. Could it okay, could be a lot enough. worse. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, I mean, we talked about it a little bit before recording this, but I, I mean, obviously the atmosphere of the crowd plays a big role in terms of how the energy of the players can be. And, and I, I think there's more, can be more of a momentum shift when you have the crowd behind you, especially if you're the, the home team, obviously. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, I thought it was very interesting. I was very curious to kind of like hear the sounds of professional level play because there's no... There's no audience. There's no screaming crowd at all times. And I don't know. It was, I, I wish they would mic up the players a little bit more so we could get maybe kind of a, a better like perspective of what's going on out there. I think that would be really cool. But overall, I mean, obviously we've all been deprived of the game for a little while now. It was, it was very exciting, very fun to watch. Yeah. Honestly, I thought it was a little bit late. I mean, I, I, I can't be happy that football is actually back and it was nice to have something, you know, on match day to be excited about and sit down, you know, go through the whole ritual of watching a football match. But then again, you know, without the crowd, it felt a little lame, to be honest. It felt like a, a, a training match. The intensity wasn't there, you know, it being a Rivera derby, you know, it just needed, I felt it needed a little bit more and... So it was kind of, you know, I, I was torn in half because I was so happy that it was back and it was great to watch football again, but it also didn't feel as nice that I had, you know, I'd built it up to in my head, if you know what I mean. Um, but I guess it just, we'll, we'll take whatever we can. And, and as you said, it's nice to hear how much these guys actually talk on the pitch. Um, speaking of, of miking up players, have you seen one of those, uh, some of those videos where they mic up the referees? Yes, I have seen those. That's very interesting. Like how much, you know, trash talk there is from the players towards the referee, how much they have to take out there on the pitch. Um, and it's just yeah, very interesting to hear. For players, it's actually probably, amazing how much professional sports referees, not just football, any sport. Jay, I, I would encourage you. I know you're, we've talked about hockey a few times on this podcast, even though it has nothing to do about it. Go, go, go on YouTube and look at some NHL mics, NHL uh, refs mic'd up and, okay. and listen to how those guys talk to the refs. It's incredible. It's so it's not nice. Oh, it's unbelievable. Like I can't even fathom playing a sport and trying to talk to the ref like that. It's amazing. But yeah, yeah, you're right. They take a lot more abuse than I think a lot of people realize. I just yeah. like being able to hear like guys throwing the ball in and like just the simple, hey, 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 like just like normal things that that like what I liked is like it almost felt like I was kind of watching a men's league game and there was really nobody else there. That's True. that's what I thought was kind of cool about it. Like it was it was a little bit more relatable when you don't have this giant crowd of screaming people and yeah, all the pressure that comes along with that. Uh-huh. I don't know. It was cool to see. I, again, I don't want to see this for for the rest of football nah. history. But nah. I think as like a as a couple of months thing, it's it's interesting. But imagine the Champions League final in an atmosphere like that. I mean, that would be pretty lame. Yeah, I mean it's it's. Uh, it's, it's lame from the perspective of, yeah, the fans definitely have an impact on the match, but I think it's, it's, it's also a completely different dynamic that I think a lot of these 
guys maybe haven't been exposed to for a long time. Cause I think when you, when you become a professional footballer and you're always playing in front of this giant crowd, there's, there's, you're right. There's a certain energy that comes along with that. So when you don't have that as like a driving force, it's, it changes up the game quite significantly. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. They basically go back to playing like they used to before they became pros, but they're just a lot more talented. I know what you mean, but it's just going to feel a little flat, I think, like the Champions League final. Is it just going to be like a, you know, a kick around with the friends? Obviously it's not, but, you know, winning a final like that might not be the same as winning, you know, with a with a stadium full of, of you know, people going absolutely nuts. But yeah. hey, let's see, let's see what's going to happen and there's nothing to do about it. And I'd rather have it like this than not having football at all. So we basically shouldn't complain too much, I think. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think everything this season, whether it's a league title or a Champions League, whatever it may be, it's all going to have an asterisk next to it because yeah. it is such a weird situation. Which is nice because that means uh, Liverpool's um, <laughs> pending championship is going to be, you know, there's still going to be the asterisk, aster- blah, that's a difficult word, asterisk next to it. Um, so it's not going to be, and I think now actually 30 years will have passed since they last won the Premier League um, when they eventually win the title. So United fans will always have that on Liverpool as well. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's not going to last for long. So we just got to, <laughs> we got to cherish it while it's there, I guess. But anyways, uh, enough about uh, football talk and what we'd like to happen, Josh. Um, Because obviously I think everyone, bar Liverpool fans, dream of Liverpool not winning the title. I'm sorry about that, but I just got to put it out there. But the topic for today is uh, is actually related to to the recent launch of uh, a very, very special product, which uh, is also one of the most expensive products we've seen come out in a long, long time, actually. The Adidas Predator Mutator 20 Plus Dragon. Now, if you uh, if you tell people a little bit about it, I'm going to go get the egg with the boots inside. Yeah, so, so, I mean, Jay just said it right there. It's a football boot that comes in an egg, which is, uh, I mean, that's interesting in itself. Um, but the boot is basically kind of the version of the new predator that I think a lot of people hope for when the new predator launched, obviously it's a knit based upper, but this new dragon variation features a fusion skin upper. So basically take the kangaroo leather upper from the Copa 20 plus and 19 plus and slap that on the predator 20 plus you include all of the demon skin rubber elements. And that's what the dragon is. But there is the, the egg, the literal egg that the boot comes in. It's one of the most insane boot boxes I've ever seen in my life. Um, the thing is that this is 400 euros, uh, I guess also sold at $400, right? In the States? Yeah, yeah, $400 US, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, so by far the most expensive football boot we've seen drop in a while. And of course it's because of the box, but also as you mentioned, because of this here, fantastic fusion skin leather that, um, that you get on the Pred. So when you open it up, it's um, it's secured inside the box, so so the egg hatches, and the boots are there. It's, it's to be fair, it's pretty cool. I like it, but the boots themselves are also just seriously next level. Uh, we're going to talk about the boots in a little bit, but it also inspired us to talk about some of the most expensive boots that have ever been released in terms of retail price. Obviously, you know, we talked about the whole reselling market, and you know, prices can be a little bit obnoxious at times, but but. What's really fun to me is to look at the retail prices where we've seen some absolutely like crazy prices from time to time. Yeah, I think that, uh, and we've mentioned this on the podcast a few times, I think people that complain about how expensive football boots are now, while I agree they are expensive, 10 years ago, they were way more expensive. Football boots have gone down in price, if anything, especially when you account for inflation as you have with some of the boots that we're going to talk about. Because I think it's important to talk about the retail at the time, but what yeah. that retail would be now if they maintain the same thing with the inflation. Because I was surprised by those numbers. I'll say that much. Yeah, let's just put it like that. But we'll we'll save that um, for a little bit longer because uh, let's just talk about these. As you mentioned, they kind of took the the fusion skin technology from the Copas uh, and probably an even better 
comparison would be to say the opera that they had on the uh, the archives, the Predator archives. That is basically what went on uh, the dragon here. They they made uh, a little bit of texturing in it to give it like the dragon scale effect. And then other than that, it's just it's just knit with a thin thin leather fused on top, and it's absolutely mind blowingly soft. I mean. Yes, we talked about soft leather boots and, you know, Mizuno leather being right up there. But in terms of how pliable it is, it's unlike anything I've ever felt. And you actually have 406 rubber spikes on there making, you know, giving it more structure. So I can only imagine what this would be like with, you know, a 20.1 low with fusion skin. Oh my, oh my days. Take my money, Adidas. Yeah, it'd be really cool. Again, they're just... It's, it's too bad that they're just trying to focus so much on pushing the 20 plus variation because you're right, a 20.1 with a leather upper would be pretty incredible. And I, I think it would once and for all kind of shut up the, the longtime Predator fans that always love to complain that the current Predator isn't a real Predator. And I, I guess it still wouldn't have the tongue. But but that's not, I don't think it's a realistic thing to put on a football boot in 2020. But if you gave that Pred 20.1 low a leather upper, that's a pretty extraordinary football boot, I have to say. I, I totally agree. And look, we can't we can't keep the tongue around because it doesn't make any sense anymore. I mean, there's other ways of cleaning up the striking surface. So, you know, may, maybe the, the, the time to have a tongue on a Pred has just passed, I think. But... Yeah, this is this is nice, and you know, I actually understand why they made this 400 euros because it must have been a a, a pretty expensive process, uh, working out how to, of course, develop fusion skin like they did for the Copa, but also, you know, putting all these little rubber elements on a leather upper. I mean, the the, the glue, the fused on the upper, which is something you can't normally do. You need to stitch elements to the upper to make them stick and and that would be a totally different game you couldn't make this boot uh so so an engineering marvel definitely worth 400 euros well you know it's a lot of money but it's also really really nice uh i just really really would love to a see it in my size <clears throat> adidas but also just on on a 20.1 low that is a serious dream i think they would sell so many pairs honestly yeah, I think it would do really well. Um, I will say, just a final note on this boot, it's it's really too bad that this whole quarantine situation is happening because I, I knew this boot was coming and I was really looking forward to the Unisport video where you guys flew out to some magical island with a real dragon and like just put the, the egg box next to the dragon and just J-Mike runs up to it and steals it away from him. Maybe the yeah. dragon blows some fire. That would have been a cool video. I would have been <laughs> looking forward to that. Didn't See the happen. thing is the thing is that after the the, the whole experience with the uh, Komodo dragons that we had for <laughs> for the first Predator Mutator, I swore that I'm never getting near any of those creatures ever again because they're <laughs> way too terrifying. But uh, but yeah, it's let's blame Corona and say that was totally going to happen if uh, if the virus hadn't hit us. So um, yeah, um, but but final note here, Josh, would you buy four hundred euros? Would you buy? I think that this is a boot, honestly, that if you're a collector and you're a fan of the Predator series, and I think that there's a lot of really cool detail to that football boot in person, then yeah, it's, it's worth the money. Is that a boot that I would buy and like, I really want to like wear? I, I can't say personally that would I be the case with would, me. Mate. I think you would. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I was a little bit skeptical, you know, when I saw the images and, you know, got the boot in hand, but then I got it on my feet and I realized this is a totally different experience to the normal Predator, which I like, but this is just, this is just next level. But again, we'll see, 400 maybe, euros, it's a lot of. It's yeah, lot. my pair is still on the way. So, I mean, if that answers your question. <laughs> fair enough. Maybe fair I'll enough. change can, my mind. You can, you can tell us later, but at least you got a pair. So that's, that's nice. Right. But 400 euros, Josh. That is, it's a lot of money, right? But For it's sure. actually not the most, it's, it's not even close to being the most expensive boot we've ever seen released. Um, so so we're, gonna, we're gonna discuss a few of them. 
obviously, uh, do you remember, uh, you know what, let's take the, the, the most direct comparison I can make to, to the Dragon Preds here, because obviously there is, let me just get it. Another Pred with a really, really cool and very, very heavy, but also extremely expensive box. The, the Predator Poles, David Beckham 723s, uh, the Yin Yangs, which are, obviously, let me just get the, the angle right here, camera. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> it, it's an amazing box. It's a wooden box. It's actually quite heavy, but it's also, you know, mind-blowingly cool. And also way cooler than, than the Dragon Box, if I may add. You got a little booklet and it was just like... Look at this thing. Who wouldn't want that on their on their desk at home? I would. But the problem was that uh, this was also $723 when it released back then, which, uh, if you correct for inflation, is actually $890 in 2020. Like that, that's, that's a lot of money for a football boot. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. And I, I mean, it comes in a presentation box. Great. Very cool. It's a unique colorway. Great. Cool. But ultimately, it's pretty much the same thing as any other Predator Pulse. Am, am I mistaken in saying that? No. I mean, no, it's, it's just a, it's just a really unique and, and, you know, it's made in just 723 pairs, which is actually more than the Dragons, which came in 500 pairs. But it's just, I guess, the box, because, because the box is so cool, the retail price also had to be higher for them to actually make some money on it. Yeah, that's that's true. Also, I have a question because I just thought of something and we haven't talked about this beforehand because we did have a quick little discussion. Remember those F50.6 tunits, the Yamamoto ones uh -huh. that they showed in those like little cages? Oh, the cages, yeah. Did that? Well, did they ever sell those or was that just like a look at this cool thing we made type thing? Because I, that's I, I remember seeing them back in the day, but I never remember actually seeing them for sale anywhere. Mm. It just made me think that's probably something along. Because that was right around that same period, if I'm not wrong. I don't think I am. Yamamoto's. Let's see. It's it's a hard boot to even look up because it's like it's it's like it a, the F50.6 is just like a forgotten model in general for the most part. Well, I they must have been for retail. Uh, they I'm just looking at you know Toffem right? Uh huh. Um, so apparently he has all four pairs, which is a little bit ridiculous. They made 250 pairs of each, but I don't know how much they were, but they all came in these cages, which is, I mean, they look ridiculous, but in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so for those that are listening and have no idea what we're talking about, they, there were these animal themed F50s. So one was a shark, one was a, uh, Lion or something? I don't even remember what they were. I just, the shark one is the one that stood out to me. What were the uh -huh. animals? You have it in front of you, probably. Um, yeah, there was the wolf and the shark, and that's kind of what I can tell right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're a little bit obscure. <laughs> I mean, they they looked interesting. I will have some images on them on screen, of course. Uh, I'm trying to find out what they cost back in the day, but I actually don't think I can find it anywhere. But I reckon being Yamamoto's, they were probably really expensive because everything Y3 is just stupid, stupidly expensive. Let's, let's put it like that. Mm -hmm. um, right, okay. You know what? I, I, I don't know what they were. The tiger, there's a tiger one also. Okay. Ah, the blue okay. ones are definitely a dragon. Mm, yeah. It's gotta be a dragon. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, yeah. they they made the um, they made the the ones in two thousand and thirteen, the the what was they what was, what was it called the yellow one, and they they also made the blue and, and green pair of the uh, the F fifty Adi Zero Zambas, pretty cool boots to be fair, but they were around two hundred and seventy five three hundred euros I think, also very expensive of course, but not quite to the extent of uh, of the Dragon boots or some of the other boots on the list we have here, but pretty good shout, to be honest. Um, also, speaking of stuff that came out back in the day, do you remember the whole uh, Nike Elite concept that was uh, doing the rounds in in uh, in 2010 and a couple of years after that? Do, do I ever? 
<laughs> so we had, the, we had the Superflies. Um, there was, of course, the T90 Laser 3 Elite, the Jumbo Legend 3 and 4 Elites, and, of course, the CTR uh, Elites and, uh, and all that stuff. It, it, it was just, like, they basically took... Well, well, depending on the model, they basically took the the normal up and then they slapped the carbon fiber outsole on, or they, uh, you know, they turned it into Kangalite because that's less expensive. And then they slapped the carbon tooling on, and uh, you know, let's sell it for more. Chimbo Legend Three. I'm looking at you. Yeah, it was one of those things where Nike was really pushing this because they started with the whole Vapor Four SL thing, right? As a general release model, where people were. And, and I was one of those people. The carbon fiber sole plate was the coolest thing in football boots at that time. Just unbelievable looking. Um, so with the success of that, I think Nike realized, hey, why don't we take this and put it on all of our models and it will allow us to charge a gigantic premium over the already fairly expensive top end models that we currently have for sale. So what they did is they promoted the Elite Series, which... Claimed these performance benefits were mainly that the boots were lighter than anything else. It wasn't a lot of like benefits in terms of traction or responsiveness or anything like that. It was just the fact that this carbon fiber sole plate made for a lighter variation of the regular Nike models. And the thing was, at, at that time, I don't think people really understood how little of a weight difference there was in most cases between the elite and the regular versions uh, with the T90, it was a little bit more significant. It was significant, I would say. But like with the CTRs, it, it was like, I think half an ounce, like you're talking like 20, 30 grams. It was not a huge amount of weight um, savings between the elite and the regular models. So you were paying this huge premium for what was kind of marketed as this big difference from Nike. But in reality, while the boots did feel a little bit different because you change a sole plate on a boot, it's going to have a slightly different fit and feel. I'm not sure that in every single situation, it was always a way better football boot. You're, you're right, definitely. Um, and the thing is that they were actually like wildly expensive. Back in the day, for instance, the, the Laser 3 Elite was uh, 333 euros. Like back in the day, that's 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 insane. The the legends were three hundred and twenty euros, and that was back then. I'm just gonna check what that is in. Um, let's see. Now I'm in pounds, still in pounds. Let's go three hundred and thirty three, and they came out and yeah, like that's that's three hundred and seventy two euros. <laughs> that's really, <laughs> for like a pair of laser three. <laughs> what do you give me? It's, that's outrageous. That is just, that was really, that was the era where Nike was really pushing the boundaries on what, what a football boot could potentially cost. Like what, how much they were literally thinking, how much can we charge where people are still going to buy these things? And I, I think in fairness to the average consumer, the Nike Elite Series was not super successful from a sales perspective. Like it, it was none of the colorways sold out at full retail price. True. And and you also have to take into consideration that back then I don't think the sales were as significant as what we see now. Just because there were less releases, so there was less reason for retailers to mark them down. Unless we look at uh unless we look at the Superflies, because they were also, of course, a part of the Elite series. And um they sold pretty well, despite actually being ridiculously bad and ridiculously expensive. Uh, the thing is, back then they were, at Unisport at least, they were 373 euros. So a lot of people say that they were 400 euros. Uh, but as you know, Unisport is the place to get slightly better prices. So um, 373 euros. Now, that was back then in 2010, 2011, 12. But, but in 2020 money, Corrected for inflation, that's 426 euros that you would pay for a standard Superfly 2 or 3. Can you believe it? That's, that's wild. Like that is a, that's insane. So, so when we talk about, you know, the Pret Dragons being wildly and outrageously expensive, that was the price for an ordinary Superfly 2 and 3, which were, you know... A, <laughs> It was so bad, man. And they still sold. I don't I don't understand. It proves that the Nike marketing machine is absolutely world class. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, clearly. Uh, the one thing I, just because we're talking about this and it's all coming back to me now, do you remember the, and, and maybe I'm wrong in this, but do you remember the very first boot to hit the $300 price point? Because mm. it wasn't, it wasn't from Nike and it wasn't from Maddie. Was it the Bickenbergs? No, I, I'm pretty sure it was the original Lotto Zero Gravity in 2006. Those, those retailed for three. I remember $300 US for retail on those. Okay. okay. Which was a like, that's, I mean, that, that is the boot that obviously is important in terms of football boot history now because of what laceless boots have turned into. But at that point in time, that's kind of the football boot that sunk the Lotto brand. That sunk it? I oh. think so. You don't think so? Because I think at that point, like your, your Lottos and your Diodoras, those are two brands that were, I think were a lot more prevalent at that point in time, but we're starting to decline because of kind of Nike was really coming up around that time I in, might, in terms of popularity. I, I understand what you say, but I would probably rather point to the follow-up, you know, uh, was it the Zero Gravity Ultra? That was like yeah, an abomination. Was. And, you know, it got the twist and go start. I think the twist and go killed Lotto. <laughs> yeah, Twist and Go was, you're right. I, twist and Go definitely was not well received at all. But I, I think the idea of having the most expensive football boot coming from the brand Lotto, and I think up until that point, Lotto's popularity was very much based around leather boots. And I think in 2006, they tried to make this transition into synthetics. And I think some of those early synthetic Lottos were actually very underrated. I'd rather wear a 2006 synthetic Lotto boot than I would a 2006 Mercurial Vapor, that's for sure. Oh yeah, but, but oh, yeah. people like at the, the time didn't the, necessarily think that the the, the takedown laced up version of the Zero Gravity called the Zero Plus was actually amazing. We've talked about this a lot, but you you know uh, I don't remember the the Zero Gravity being as expensive, but you might be right. I yeah, just, I'm pretty sure it was three hundred bucks. Shit, it, was a lot, a lot. it was a lot of money. I remember that much. Also, if people remember the Bickenbergs brand, I don't remember how much, but I just back then recall them being, you know, looking at them. They had this very circular design. I'll show an image on screen right now. Uh, they, they look ridiculous, but because it was a fashion item, they were just expensive. So but I don't- Okay, I, I remember these. <laughs> pretty, pretty. I think, uh, was it Ludovic Julie who wore them back in the day? Oof. Might have. I just remember seeing them on a, on a pro thinking, what is he, what is that? That is ridiculous. <laughs> but anyway, uh, back, back to, um, back to talking about expensive boots. Of course, we also had the, do you remember the, the messy 10, 10 drops that, that you can only buy if you know, you went to the messy museum in Barcelona. <sighs> they were those also, were, were those the green? Yes. Messy 16 plus. Yes, they were. Okay. I do I think, remember them. I then. think they were sold in New York, actually. Um, I might be wrong, but they also they also had the first 1010 that was in Barcelona. I know that uh, the Pred Collective, Chris Kemp and uh, Derek Leon, DL Boot Room, they actually went to Barcelona to, you know, like sleep in a line, spent the night in the streets of Barcelona to, uh, to make sure they got a pair. Now that's dedication, my friends. And that was between 380 and 400 euros back then. So also, uh, you know, a hefty layout. Have you, have you ever done that? Have you ever gone and waited in line for like a, yeah, a yeah. release of any kind of nope. footwear? No? no, no. I mean, I've sat in, like I've been sat in line or I've been, I've been ready when stuff has dropped on, on Nike.com for instance, stuff that we haven't had at Unisport. Those, uh, Vapor 9 CR7 boots that came out in 100 pairs, the two colorways of that. I, I was, you know, on the money ready, but I haven't done it physically. Have you? Don't strike uh, me as the one kind time. Of guy. Really? One time. Wow. So here's what happened it was, it was Boxing Day a long time ago. Um, and this one sneaker store in our town was, uh, it was Jordan, was it Boxing Day or was it, maybe it was Black Friday. Okay. But uh, the Jordan 6s were coming out in black and infrared. Okay. And I was going on that morning to go play pickup pick up hockey, like right in the same area as where this mall was, where the sneaker store was. So I had to wake up at that time anyway. So I'm like, you know what? I might as well just get up the extra half an hour, show up, wait in line, get the sneakers and then go play hockey, whatever. It's great. Perfect. 
So I'm waiting in this line and I remember I, I was really young at the time. I was maybe like 19, 20. It was just like a weird situation for me. I'd never done anything like this before. And it's like all these like basically just like grown men that are just way too into sneakers. And, and there was like, I remember waiting in this line and like no one's talking to each other. Everyone's like kind of like looking at each other angrily. And like, there's like this one guy trying to like ask what size everybody needs and stuff. And nobody wants to say, cause I think they're worried about the guy in front of them in line getting their size. Cause it was like first come first serve. Like they only had like maybe a size run or two of these things. Luckily I was able to get my size, but I remember it being a very uncomfortable, like 20 minute wait. I didn't show up that early. Imagine spending very- the night like that. Month. Oh man. That's, that's outrageous to me. I could never do that. Wow. Okay. Well, that's like the people you ever seen when like the new Xbox or the PlayStation comes out and yeah, people like yeah. wait outside of a Walmart. Like, yep. You really need it that bad. <laughs> no, and you can just get, get it. it you can get it two days later if you buy it off the internet. But I mean, you got it. You got to respect the hustle and you know, uh, yeah. Fair play to those people. They really want it. And you know, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not against it. Let's, let's just put it like that. Now, one one final boot I want to uh, to mention, Josh, is uh, perhaps the most expensive football boot ever. Um, that is a pair of Puma boots, actually, the Puma Evo Speeds that uh, Puma made in collaboration with Hublo, the or Hublo, or however you say the name. It's Swiss, so I don't know. Um, but with the watch brand Hublo, and um, you had to buy a watch to get a boot. And the two watches that you could buy to get a boot was either seventeen thousand or forty thousand dollars to get to get the football boot. Now, obviously, some people bought the watch and they got the boot and have later sold the boot off. Uh, so it's actually you know a manageable price. But I think it's it's a it's a really fun story. But also like, <laughs> what the actual. F- <laughs> that was that was like a collaborative thing with Falcao, no? Am I wrong? Yeah, it on was. That? It was. Right? So again, I don't remember what year that was, but I, I've never been into watches. I I have a few friends that are into watches. I've never been, it's never been my thing. I bought this one. You guys have G-Shock watches over there? Yeah, yeah. Those like rubbery ones. Uh-huh. Well, I got one like first year, like I was like 19 years old. Right. This goofy red one. It's like a hundred bucks. And I was like really proud. I don't know why I wanted it at the time, but I bought it. And it's like, I'm like one of those people that when I wear a watch, I like knock it off of everything. Like I walk in a doorway and somehow I'm clipping the watch on the edge of the doorway. So I just, from that point forward, I'm like, you know what? I, I don't think expensive watches are ever going to be my thing because I'm just afraid of damaging it. Anyways, yeah. so this boot comes out and I'm like, oh, I saw the watch before I saw the boot. I'm like, that's a, that's a pretty cool watch. But I, I knew nothing about them. I'm like, what, what's Hublot? Hublot? I don't know what this is. So I go look it up, right? And I'm like, having a hard time even finding a store for this. So I end up on this like black market, like rot watch resale website. And I'm, I'm seeing the prices of Hublot watches. And I'm like, oh, Wow, this is never mind. I'm not I'm definitely not getting this. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I spoke to I, I mentioning Derek again. I spoke to him and he um he's actually managed to pick up a pair of those uh Evo Speed, Uplo Evo Speeds. And you know, apparently they're really hard to get your hands on because you had to buy the flipping watch. Um he yeah, didn't I, yeah. I don't think he bought the watch, but uh but yeah. That's um well well Jay, if you think about it, if you are are in a position where you're just gonna like buy a forty thousand dollar watch, they're gonna give you I have to assume that when you buy most forty thousand dollar watches, there's some kind of elaborate gift that it comes with. And this one just happened to be a pair of football so. boots. So right. So, so somebody probably most people that bought this watch probably just got the boots like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna like throw them in a closet or like give them to my kid and who cares, right? Like most people bought it, had no idea what they even had. And again, realistically, like how much are the boots really worth? I know it's like an exclusive thing and it's very well, expensive to get them 40 in the first grand. place. <laughs> My God, I know. It's just, it's one of those weird, very weird marketing strategy by Puma. But I mean, it's it's certainly memorable. So I'll give them that. Absolutely. So, I, I mean, I'm not aware of any football boot having a higher retail price than 40 grand. I, I hope to God that there isn't any more expensive boots than that. But but if we've missed any like ridiculously res- expensive boots, guys, let us know in the comment section right down below because- Oh, we it- didn't, we, okay, we did miss one, Jay. We got to talk about the Mercurial SL. 
Yeah, but was it that expensive? I, I'm pretty sure retail on that was $400, if I'm not mistaken. See, what I can find in that, what, what it cost back then was like 200 and f- No, that can't be right. That no, can't, can't be, be right. right. It's, it's- I can't be right. Because I remember when I, when I got a pair of Vapor 4 SLs right. back in the day, and they had just gone on sale, and I, could fi- I finally had enough money to buy them. I remember the the Mercurial SL because it, that's the funny thing about that boot. It's like so desirable now, but it didn't sell out back in the day because it was it was legitimately that expensive. And that's the boot that I really wanted, but I just it was literally double the price of a Vapor Four SL, so I didn't buy them. But I'm pretty sure those were 400 bucks retail. The thing is that in Europe they were like 220 pounds, 230, oh, really? 30, 30 it, 40 pounds. I mean, it's a lot of money, especially back then, but it wasn't. It wasn't outrageous, if you know what I mean. Oh, maybe they, maybe they were more in the U.S. Yeah, might have might have been. I mean, four hundred dollars is also what I recall. I even thought they were five hundred dollars, but at least what I can what I can see that they they were in Europe. It's it wasn't as much as I thought it was. All right. Well, I figured we'd mention it either but, way. But then again, you know, if we look at resale prices, this is one of those boots that have just like skyrocketed and I hate it because it's the one boot I still need for the collection you you and me both but um, it's a tough please, one please to don't get, sell yeah. us any more fake carbon SLs because we don't, we don't want to buy you can get it for 200 euros Josh was it was <laughs> it like it was ridiculous like anyway <laughs> let's move on to uh, to some questions remind us if there are any other really expensive boots in the comment section right down below but now we're going to jump on to some questions here uh, we have one from Galford what do you think about leather versions of synthetic models like the Vapor Furon and the Phantom and why are pro players not using them so I'm assuming the question is why aren't pros using the the Techcraft Vapors or, or Phantoms or uh, you know the leather Furons um, That's a good question. Well, my, my thoughts on, on converting a synthetic boot or a knitted boot into leather when it wasn't necessarily the, the choice of the brand from the get-go is it kind of often comes off as an afterthought. I, I mean, you, if you take something that was designed to be a specific way and you change the material of the upper, obviously there are exceptions to this rule where I think like a Predator 20 Plus with a leather upper makes sense. A vapor with a leather upper, I think, makes less sense. But it's a I good just boot. Think it, it's a good boot, but I think it, it takes away from what the, the initial concept behind it was supposed to be in the first place. Right. I think it's a little bit more evident for me with uh, with the Phantom Venom tech crafts, where it's just like, this, what's that point? Yeah, yes, that's now, now super you put, afterthought. Now you put Allegria leather on it, and it's like, it's, it's a cool story, bro, but wh- Why? It's not is is not a significantly better football boot. So, the vapors I like personally, but I think it's more of a like a marketing thing. So the brands want to have their prime assets in their you know their main packs, which are made with synthetics or knits mostly. So I guess it's just yeah. I I, I guess it's due to to the brands not giving them to their players really. Yeah, I, I think a big misconception from, from a consumer perspective about limited edition releases is that brands make money on them. I don't, I don't think they do in most cases. Like, I know that this new Pred is 400 bucks, but I, they only built 500 pairs. It's expensive to, tool, to, to basically figure out how to make that, actually produce it, because there's a variation in even the prime knit collar let yeah. alone the leather upper. Yeah. Then the box yeah. is expensive. Box is expensive, to, yeah to figure out how to, how to manufacture that. So you sell 500 pairs. Did you really make your money back? It's, it's not, nah, that's a statement. I'd thing. be surprised if they did. Right. And that's the case with a lot of limited stuff. They release it more so as like a hype building thing mm. rather than something to make money on well, or their the money maker is the general release product where they make it once and then they release it in 40 different colorways. And at a certain point it becomes profitable. Yeah. Well, that's, that's how it works. Um, Another question here is from Steph Pieri. Do you think that Nike should have an option of a Tayshin upper on the Vapors like on the Vapor 10 and 11 as there's still a demand for it? Um, from a boot nerd's perspective, yes. Yes. From, from a general consumer perspective, I don't think that it does that well. <laughs> but wasn't it nice to have Tayshin 
as an option on the Vapor 12 Pro, for instance. Yeah, I think it was. But maybe but it do you think, makes more but sense. I think, but Jay, I think we're like, we're being too caught up in our own little yeah. bubble of boot nerdness in terms of thinking that the vast majority of people who bought a Vapor 12 Pro bought it because of that upper. I think most people who bought a Vapor 12 Pro bought it because they didn't have the money to spend on the Elite. You're, you're making way too much sense now for it, for it to be fun. <laughs> Like, <laughs> let's let's keep living in our little bubble here, right? Now, now I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. And maybe in terms of selling the whole fly knit story from the elite version, you're getting a an actual knitted upper on on the pro version is what makes more sense from like a marketing point of view. Uh, it would be fun and it would be nice to see a Vapor 13 intation, um, OLM, whatever it would be called these days. It will be interesting, but do they really need it? I guess not. It's kind of the same as, you know, Techcraft Vapors. They're nice, but I mean, I wouldn't be against it, but I don't really think it makes that much sense from a Nike point of view. Yeah, two versions of the Mercurial is probably too much at the same time. We already maybe have a limited, two versions Maybe a limited of the release would be cool. Yeah. Maybe a limited release would be cool. I just think, personally, I think synthetic boots in general are kind of missing from today's market. But what I feel if like they, there is still potential for that. What if they gave us a knitted Superfly and then a, a, a Tajin Vapor? I, I'm 100% all for that. Nike will we'll take, we'll take 10%. It's not much. We'll take it. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> let's let's pitch them an idea that they were doing for two generations of Mercurial and then claim it as our own. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you fake it till you make it, right? Anyways, um, Aaron Beagler, what uh, what's your opinion on purchasing playing in customized boots from, uh, for example, Kekasu's custom hydro dipping or painting over your football boots? Like, I don't know about you, um, I think the whole hydro dipping thing is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't take hydro dipping seriously. That's just, that's just my point of view. Um, for me, it's like, I don't know why you do it. Cause yeah, you know, you know, your boots might look funky, uh, but you can't really play in it cause it's going to fall off. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not a, like a custom art boot kind of guy. It just doesn't. I want to. I want to play in my boots, and often the you know the customs that you can get are very wild, and they're like very in your face. And I don't, uh, not really into that. Yeah, I'm. I'm with you. I think the custom, the spectrum of like quality of custom sneakers and football boots in general is is it's quite large. So you have some that are like very basic, and I'm with you on the hydro dip thing. I just think it looks very cheap. Yeah. Like if I see. People who think hydro dipped carbon fiber looks cool. I, I don't know what it like. If you're trying to impress people into thinking that your boots are made out of carbon fiber, someone who would be impressed by the look of carbon fiber is going to know that that's fake carbon fiber. Yeah. Just saying. Don't do it's, it's just like the whole fake boot argument. You think you got this fake boot in this unreleased colorway and you're going to convince somebody that this is like, it's one of one. The person who's going to be impressed is going to know that they're fake. So I, I don't know for me, like, yeah, if you really want to paint your boots or get someone to paint your boots and have something very like unique and and one of one, go for it. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. How well a lot of these customs hold up from actually being used. I mean, I guess that depends on how much, how they were painted and how they yeah. were prepped. Because I know a lot of the painting too, they actually have to strip the surface of the material to get the paint to stick in the first place. Otherwise it'll just kind of like, yeah. it, it, like a wearable sole plate finish, kind of just like break off as you wear them. So yeah, I'm not, I'm with you. I'm not like against it I by also, any means, but I don't feel the need to have it. Yeah. I, I used to black out my boots, like buy um, leather dye and, you know, black them out using that. And it always just ended up looking really, really shitty, to be honest. I think I have a pair of Superfly ones. Uh, oh yeah. I have a pair of Superfly ones back there. They're, I, I want to, yeah, I can show them to you guys, but it's what, what I want to say is that if you can get someone to actually customize your boots with like, we see with some sneaker customize, customizers. Yeah. People doing yeah. custom sneakers, they actually take elements from different sneakers. They swap out the toolings and all that stuff. And you know, they turn it into like a Frankenstein, you know, one of one 
where the elements actually work together and it's not just a you know paint paint job of you know a cartoon version of Batman sitting on the side of the I don't want that stuff. That's not my kind of jam. <laughs> but but the whole swapping elements, you know, th- that's kind of cool. I, I I like that. It it is cool, but it's it's something that just just in regards to what Jay just talked about there, if you were to take a soul plate off of a football boot and just put on a Brit, a different upper. It, you're never going to get a strong enough bond to where that boot's now going to hold up. And that's always a disclaimer with a lot of these custom sneakers where they do a sole swap is like, hey, you can walk around in these. You can wear them casually. But if you like try to play basketball or try to run in them, they're probably going to fall apart on you. So the same thing would apply, especially to a football boot. I'm actually surprised that you used to black out your boots like that. Yeah, so am I. I... I I thought about it several times because it was kind of back back in those days. That was kind of a cool thing to do. I also love the fact that that's a yellow boot and you could have bought the black colorway instead. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I awesome. wish I wish I had been as clever as you were back then. So uh, so yeah, that was my blackout adventure. I didn't do it ever again because. <laughs> I did. I actually did. I tried to black out a pair of my uh, dragon power swerves, you know, the red one, the synthetic one. It, it was an absolute disaster. It, don't do it. it. It ended up cracking up. Nah, it was terrible. Absolutely terrible. Because the, the die was just sitting on top of the, the, the coating on the, nah, it was yeah, terrible. <laughs> don't go there. Uh, last question here uh, from Levi Winter. How would you compare a well-broken in pair of boots with a thicker, stiffer upper, say, Hyperven and Phantom 2s, to a brand new pair of thinner, softer boots, for example, of Phantom Vision? And what would you rather play in? I, I mean, maybe it's a bit of an obvious answer, but I, I like Levi's way of thinking. Like, do you, do you, would you rather have a really well broken in pair of boots or go to someone, something that's brand new, but incredibly soft? I mean, for me, I, I just want the better football boot. I think you're going to get to that point regardless of what it is. Um, I, look, I, as much as I like synthetics, I am, I am... I'll admit that there were a lot of synthetics that I liked once upon a time that are not very good by today's standards. Football boots have improved (laughs) drastically. (laughs) And I think that's right. But Jay, (laughs) I think you can, there's so many people that I know even watch this podcast that'll make the argument that football boots have gone downhill from a quality perspective Hmm. versus what they used to be, which I think that's a fair argument. But I think when you're talking about step in comfort and break in time, football boots have never been as comfortable as they are now. I agree. To me, it's a relatively straightforward answer. I would definitely always have the upper that is by nature the softest because that's going to take no time to break in. And, you know, yes, a well-broken in pair is always going to be, it, it's going to be nice and all, but, you know, the upper is always going to have more structure to it. And, I, I, you know, breaking in a pair of, of really stiff boots is always going to be a hassle with a, 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 a brand new pair with a super soft upper like the Vision. You don't need to break them in. There's no worry. You can just, it's plug and play. You can just take them, go out on the pitch. And if you don't use set, say the Hyper Venom Phantom 2s for a while, they're going to stiffen up a little bit and you might have to break them in the last 20% again if you haven't worn them for a while. So yeah, definitely Vision for me. Soft. Appeal. Yeah, I'm with you on that for sure. And now we're out of questions, which is also nice because we're also running out of time. So, uh, so again, guys, uh, it was a little bit of a, you know, we just talk about everything in today's episode. Uh, football is back, expensive football boots, uh, you know, reminiscing old stuff, answering some questions. But of course, if you have any questions you'd like us to answer, you should leave them in the comment section right down below where you can, of course, also tell us if we missed any very expensive football boots. And if we did, we're sorry. What you should also do is to totally leave a like on the video if you had a good time. And of of course, also make sure that you subscribe to the Boot Nerds podcast by clicking the white circle in the middle of your screen. Now, if you're feeling generous or you just want to treat yourself to uh, some more football gear love, you can also go and subscribe to Josh's channel right over on his side of the screen or Unisport by clicking the green bubble near my head. And uh, I think with those words, I've been Jay Mike and I approve this message. See you in the next one. Bye, guys. And I didn't screw up. <laughs>